Hello, welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan. And we post a video every Friday, so don't forget to subscribe and press the alert button so that you can keep up with our adventures. And if you've got a burning horticultural question for Stephen Ryan, put it in the comments below and we'll try and answer it in our Monday Shorts. Yes, so there you go. And today... I'm feeling eerily familiar, Stephen. Yes, today we've come to uh, Gentiana Nursery in the Dandenongs at Linda, uh, and we've done several videos with Craig on specific groups of plants. And today we're going to look at a group of begonias, believe it or not. Now, you might be aware that we've made an epic begonia, tuberous begonia care video with Peter Harris of White House Nursery. So we'll link that below. And that has been incredibly successful, but we're very aware I love rhizomus and cane begonias. So yeah. here we are, another specialist who's going to give us the 101 on begonia care. Yes. And it is a big genus when you consider it comes from all around the equator. Mm. We unfortunately don't seem to have any Australian native ones, but they're all through Papua New Guinea, Southeast Asia, right across into Africa. And then there's another big concentration of them over in South America as well. And I think at the last time I checked, uh, there was uh, 2,091 accepted species and they seem to be coming up weekly with new ones. Isn't it extraordinary? It's one of those groups of plants, a little like orchids, where yeah. people are constantly discovering new begonias. Mm. Yes, and any wonder, I mean, they just grow in such a wide diversity of, uh, mm. of habitats within the tropical binomes. Those places are stuffed with plants we haven't even found yet. And, and obviously you've got to find them, then you've got to name them. Uh, and and all those processes need to be gone through. And I reckon at least weekly, I see a new begonia pop up. And one of the things we'll talk to Craig about is, well, there's that huge breadth of origin of the species as yeah. well. Obviously, begonias have been hybridized for well over a century. Obviously, there's new discoveries though, but a lot of those would certainly be altitude growers, yeah. even though they're in the equator. So what we have discovered, which we'll get to later, is a lot of quite cold tolerance. Yes. Well, I can remember walking the Inca Trail when I was young and fit, uh, and I saw a number of begonias growing up at incredibly high altitudes uh, where it did get quite cold at night. They were flourishing. They just needed that moisture. Mm, well... Without any further ado, we should go and call Craig from the potting shed and go and talk to him all things begonias. Yes, let's do that. Well, hello, Craig, and thank you for allowing us back into your domain. Yes, pleasure. thank you, Craig. And as we mentioned, we've made two videos here. No, three, actually. Three? Yes. Your New Zealand foliage plants, your bonsai collection, mm -hmm. and hostas. And I hope you've sold many a hosta. Yes, I have. It's gone well for me. Fantastic. <laughs> well, yeah. begonias are next, apparently. That's right. And when we were here, you did say, you've got to come back for begonias. So as we've said, we've made our tuberous begonia video, yep. but there are many other begonias. Yes, of the 2,091 accepted species at the moment. No, it's probably 92 by now. Yeah, well, it probably is. Somebody's Someone's discovered one. Yeah. yeah, so here we've got just a little bit of a selection of the diversity within the genus, just to show people just how diverse they can be. Absolutely amazing. So I guess the first thing is we're in this beautiful um, polytunnel, Craig. Why have you got these particular begonias? So what are you attracted to? Because the, the genus is so massive and there's so many hybrids. What do you look for? I look for uh, something that's going to sell in the nursery. <laughs> <laughs> and that's See, like somebody who's honest. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and you just don't know until mm. you put it out there whether, whether it's going to move or not. So mm, you, mm. there's a fair bit of trouble. So you're driven there. by commerce. With the begonias? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Now, you might be driven by commerce, Craig, yeah. as, as we often are. Which is fine. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, mm. I, there, there's no reason why people shouldn't make money out of plants. I think it's a, a laudable pursuit. But you are in a specific sort of a climate. Uh, so what can you tell us about the climatic conditions in this area and whether that's had any impact on the style and forms of begonias that you've gone for? It definitely has. Yeah. It, I would say we're right at the edge of begonia territory here. Right. So um, any colder and they wouldn't grow. Yeah. So yeah. there, in fact, is the challenge now thrown out to me because I would say that where I am is an even more difficult climate for yes. begonias because mm. we do actually get some quite substantial frosts where I come from. But I've got this sense that my front veranda could become a begonia habitat. So who knows? Yeah. We'll see. Well... So I'm in Melbourne, yeah. neither of you, so I'm in this 
basically the inner city. You're in Mount Macedon, very different climate. The Dandenong's very much milder than you. Oh, yes, uh -huh. yes. So I can have... The world's your oyster, Matthew. <laughs> I can have, or I can have, I was going to say oysters. I can have begonias basically outside undercover all year. I mean, including some that are sort of allegedly much more tropical. I mean, they're all from the equator, but yeah. some that will be lowland, I guess, and warmer, but they seem to be fine. But what would your coldest winter minimum be here? Two? That would be rare. So two degrees centigrade, which yeah. would be the high 30s, low 40s Fahrenheit. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But yours would get below zero Yeah, we'd get centigrade. below zero comparatively regularly, you know, at least once or twice a winter. Mm. And sometimes in some winters, we'll actually get a series of those days, which can actually be even worse than just having one frost, because yeah. things will sometimes come through the one. But if they keep getting hammered, uh, then it has a real impact on the plant. And what are the tips or tricks then to keep them happy during winter? They need to be tight in the pot. So oh, right. lots of roots. Well, they, so they, they don't mind being the pot bound. Mm. And, and a, a pot that's half empty it stays wet. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Um, now I've got some sort of Rex types in Melbourne and they're outside and they do basically become deciduous. Mm -hmm. Is that? That's normal. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that happens here with pretty much all of them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So midwinter is not the kind of time to come and have a look at your begonia No, collection. it's not. Now, but, you mentioned to me before, too, one of the reasons you went into begonias, commercially, uh, was also to move into the uh, indoor plant market to an extent. Well, every second person coming into the nursery wanted indoor plants, and I didn't have anything to sell them. So. Yeah. So begonias were it, in a sense. Well, I had one down here in the polytunnel that seemed to go quite well, so I thought I'll get another few and see what happens. Oh, God and God this God. is what happens. Yes. Yes. Right. yes, suddenly the polytunnel is taken over by begonias. Yes, it's not difficult. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I think what we might do now, Craig, is just go and look at the two, well, we, you've got three, but... The major groups. The major types. So we've, as we've already said, we've looked at tuberous begonias, so we're ignoring that. But we might go and look at rhizomus, cane and shrub and just see what the differences are between those three. Mm -hmm. Okay, Greg, so we're going to just talk about the three types that we are covering in this video. Mm -hmm. So this is rhizoma. So what are the key characteristics of rhizomus begonias? Well, it, it doesn't make a, a, a stem like a, like a cane or a shrubby begonia. It has these little rhizomes that creep around at yeah. ground level. Yeah. And herbaceous here in the winter. Right. So it goes down in the winter. Yeah, so I've noticed that with mine. And that, I guess, wouldn't happen in their native habitat. But right. So they're quite adaptable. Yeah, I, th I think anywhere, I think in Sydney, they'd be evergreen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Um, now, we're going to talk about propagation later on, but I'm just looking at that rhizome as it's creeping along the pot. Mm. Could you just chop that and shove uh, it in a pot? This one was chopped up. A couple of weeks, well, um, probably a month ago. Is this Exhibit it A? It is, yes. Look at that, and it's so, even decided to flower. But look at the leaf, my goodness. It's like an animal print, isn't it? It is. And I guess, well, there are two, well, there are three things maybe about begonias, essentially. You've got the foliage, which is just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The flowers, which are often stunning. And yeah. then the form of the thing, which is quite beautiful. And in fact, when we were here last time, which was in spring, we did take some shots of a lot of the rhizomus ones that were in bloom. Yeah. So we'll drop those in now. Um, anything else we need to know about rhizomus begonias? Feed them. Yeah. Keep them dry in the winter. And how often would you feed? Over the warmer months, every time I water them. Oh, okay. And then in winter, nothing? Well, depends what they're doing. If they're really dormant, yes, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, if there's a little bit of growth, you might feed them once or twice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go and look at cane begonias. All right. Now, Craig, this is a completely different group of begonias. So I know that as a cane begonia. And how does it vary in its requirements, needs, etc.? When I first started collecting them, I thought the canes were going to be easier. Mm -hmm. And so I bought a lot of canes. Yeah. yeah I think actually the rhizomes are easier. With in your this cool, cool climate. climate. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the canes, are, by the end of winter, they've dropped all their leaves. So they look pretty skeletal. They look time. pretty skeletal. Yeah. yeah. Now, this one here, you just surprised me with because I thought I'd picked up something that was either a shrub or even a cane begonia. But you tell me that this it's isn't. A rhizome. Really? Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's bizarre. It's one called griffin. And it looks more like it's a shrubby one because it's got these quite heavy 
trunky stems yeah. on it. Go, go figure. Yeah, <laughs> it's not fair. They just keep throwing things at you and you. there's always the exception to the rule, which is a bit of an annoyance sometimes. So this one's actually a rhizome, but it looks like it, it fits looks, in the other group. Yes, it does, excepting that it's sort of different. Well, well, I, I agree with you there. Yeah. It's definitely different, but I'm not quite sure how it's different. But, you know, one of these might have to go home with me. Nonetheless, I think it's a stunningly beautiful plant. The cane begonias, there seems to be a lot of forms around there. Are they mainly the ones that are being cultivated? Are they wild species or are they hybrid forms? Mostly hybrids, I think. Mm, yeah. yeah, mostly from maculata. So you get that spotting on the leaf. Yes, that seems to be a dominant thing with the canes getting that spotting. And maculata, as I understand it, is from South America. It so um, that's the origin also of a lot of the tuberous begonias and quite a number of the groups of begonias that we grow as garden plants. Uh, yeah, from, from Mexico all the way down yeah. to probably the northern yeah. part of Argentina. Now, if the climate is suiting cane begonias, I've seen some very tall ones. What sort of height can one expect from a, a cane begonia? Uh, two and a half, three metres if, if, if they're left alone yeah. and they're happy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which I, is quite a substantial bush. It is. Yeah. They, they, I think if you let them get that tall, they'd be a bit sort of leggy. Yeah. Yeah. So pruning them back would be appropriate. Actually, we've mentioned it, so we might as well look at that. If you were going to prune a cane begonia down, when would be the time you would deal with it? You do it just at the beginning of summer, so that it has the whole summer to grow again. So not early spring even? No. No, so you It'll do just it... sit there in early spring until yeah. the weather warms up. All ah, right, so there you go. So it's a completely different pruning time than you would expect with a lot of other plants. I mean, when I prune something, I want it to grow back quickly. Yeah, well, that is the point, isn't it? If you yeah. cut something down in the autumn or early winter and it's not going to do anything until the following late spring, that's an awful lot of garden time that's being taken up for something that's not particularly attractive. That's right, and it's detrimental to the health of the plant, I think. Yeah. 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 All right, Craig, first thing, I am a lover of terracotta and mm -hmm. it's thrilling to see all your begonias in such fabulous pots. So pot culture, obviously, kind of a no-brainer. They do very well. They love terracotta. Do they? Yeah, they do. Why yeah. is that? Because it dries out more. Right. More quickly. Okay. Yeah. Now, I've noticed in here, your mix seems to have a bit of perlite and actually almost sort of small bark. So what is the potting mix you use? That's pumice and pine bark. Okay, which is yeah. like an orchid mix almost. Almost, yeah, a bit, bit finer perhaps. Okay, yeah. and you mentioned before about feeding, so you're basically feeding these every watering. All the time, yeah. During the growing season. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Now, we're in your nursery, in your beautiful polytunnel, where everything is looking healthy and gorgeous. Pests, what are the kind of issues that people will confront? The, the worst pest I get here is aphids. Oh, okay. Yeah, I get some mildew in the winter when it gets cold. Yeah. But I just tend to chuck the leaves out. So you don't spray them with an antifungal? I don't use any sprays, no. No. Nope. Why would I use an antifungal when they're growing under a huge beech tree and it would kill all the fungus associated with the beech tree? True. <laughs> well, I'm all about mycorrhizal fungi too. Yeah, that's, that's right. Gonna, no fungicide on It's going to save yeah. us. Oh, that's it good is. to know. Yeah, and it's also going to make plastics. I know, they're eating plastic. Yeah. I know, literally, yeah. mycorrhizal fungi are going to save the world. Um, anything else? I don't think so. It's just routine maintenance, you know, taking out the old leaves when yeah. they start getting damaged. And, and so I'm talking about me now. It's all yeah. about me because I have a lot of begonias at home in Melbourne. When they do drop their leaves, the rhizomous ones, so my cane begonias are fine in winter. It's mm -hmm. the rhizomous ones that get more affected from my perspective. Yep. When they drop, I mean, obviously you just pick off the dead leaves and just I just leave them. That's right. Just make sure they're dry. Mm. That, that's the key. Yeah. If they're wet and they've got no leaves, they'll rot very quickly. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now I do get occasional fungal problems, yeah. which I'm bemused by because mine are growing outside undercover, but there's lots of air movement. Yeah. I can't give you an answer to that. Is, is it all varieties or is it across the board? Or no, just, some? just the odd one. And, and it's re, it's repeats on that, that one? Yeah. I wouldn't grow it. <laughs> that is a very, very good answer. Okay. Yeah. i tell you the one it is. It's one that has a cordex. I forget the name of it. Oh, that's Dregii. Dregii. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's around here somewhere. It likes to be super dry. Ah because the cordex is indicative of a plant that comes from very dry conditions. Right, so that's my error. It's probably just in too, too moist a condition. Yep. Right. 
The other thing I get is caterpillars, which just love to munch them. What can you do? Not a lot. I love butterflies. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Munch away. <laughs> All right. Well, I think what we're going to do now is take a segue to go and look at propagation because that is the next question I'm sure everyone will have. So let's head down to your potting shed. All right, let's do it. So we're working with a couple of different types of begonias. So we've got, uh, what types are we working with in fact, Craig? Rhizometus, yep. shrubby, cane. Those, right. Those two really go together in terms of the propagation technique. All right, so we're talking about, well, let's start with the cane ones yep. because that's a more classical type of propagation. So we'd be taking stem cuttings. Yes. What time of the year would you suggest is the best time to do it? When they're in full growth. So you so need to do it through the warmer months. That's right. Yeah. Yes, so in, in, in Victoria, December, January, February. You yes. Want no later than that because yeah. then you've, you've got to get them through the winter. Ah, yes. So you need to get the plants struck and... A bit established. A bit established before the cold weather sets that's in. Right. So um, if you're taking the cuttings, how long would they normally take to strike? Oh, it's a matter of weeks. Yeah, so quite two, quickly. Two, three weeks if yeah. you do it in the warm weather. Yeah, yep. all right. So, and the other one we're looking at is the rhizominous one. Yep. Now, that's quite a different style of propagating. So you better talk us through what you would do with cuttings of those. Leaf cuttings with the rhizomatous. Yeah. If you want to take cuttings. If you had a pot full of rhizomes, then I just split that. Ah, yeah, so you could actually divide. Chop them up. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. And so, again, you'd do that in the warmer weather. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Can you actually divide a cane begonia now that you've talked about division? It's, um, is that a possibility too? It is, but you're not going to get as many. Yeah. You might get, you know, maximum half a dozen. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess for those who are a little nervous about propagating things from cuttings, I guess you've got a pre-rooted piece that you're working That's with. That's right. Yeah. So if it, you only want one or two, mm, perfect. Yeah. Now, getting back to the rhizominous ones, the other thing that I can remember being told about was the fact that you could strike them even from just a sort of a triangular piece of leaf. Anywhere where you see a vein. So yep. you could, you know, strike it from here or from the main vein there. Yeah, so you could just cut that section out yep. and create a cutting from those. Mm -hmm. Would you be bothered doing that? No. <laughs> And the reason is that I've tried it, yeah. and it wasn't terribly successful, which is probably due to negligence on my part. Yeah. But, you know, I have a lot to look after, um, and I don't need that many. Yeah. 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 And so, I, yeah. If you had heat and you were monitoring them and making sure they didn't get fungus and that sort of thing, you could yeah. propagate a lot that way. All right. Well, let's yeah. have a. You've got that in your hand, so let's yep. start with the leaf cutting on that. All right, Craig, why don't we start by showing people how to produce a cutting uh, as a leaf cutting on a rhizominous uh, begonia. I okay. think that's a, a great thing to be able to do. So I want to just reju dramatically reduce the leaf mass. So you're taking off all of the, the, the basic part of the leaf, yeah. bringing it down to almost the center of the leaf. That's right. And there's no particular um, uh, amount that you would feel is necessary? No, it doesn't need much. Yeah. Yeah. So you just need a little bit of greenery there yeah. for the it's chlorophyll and yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's a cutting. Now, do you prepare the base of the leaf stem? Yeah, just, you need about, what's that, two centimeters? Yeah, yeah, that looks about that yeah. length, yes. Yeah. All right, so we can see that you've left only a, a smidgen of the original leaf size. Yes. So that stops transpiration, I guess, because yeah. uh, the whole leaf wouldn't be able to cope with what moisture Probably was getting. could, but, you know, it's a lot easier for it yeah. this way. And I guess the other thing, too, is if you're doing a number of them, you can, you know, have them closer together. Whereas if That's you've got right. the great big leaf, it'd be a problem. And I guess getting water into the pot. Yep. So all those things come into it. So that's all you need to start off a new baby begonia. Absolutely. And that will be struck in three weeks or thereabouts. Yeah. So you use a bit of rooting hormone. Oh, really? I wouldn't have thought with a softwood cutting or a soft leaf cutting like that, you'd necessarily need it. it speeds things up a bit, I think. All oh, right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it doesn't rot them off, though, because no. I find with some things, if I use a hormone, it actually can be counterproductive. I've never experienced that. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. So we just, yeah, just a little bit on the stem. Yes. And then just push it into the soft medium. That's right. And, and what you'll find is that when the roots start first, and then you will get started getting growth out from around here. Oh, right in the centre. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You just poke that in there so it's nice and loose. What yep. sort of propagating medium are we using? Uh, sand, peat, and um, perlite. All right. So it's a mixture of sand, peat, and perlite. No yep. particular ratio no, of any no, importance? No. All right. And so you water that in. 
I water that in. And where will you place that cutting? Somewhere sheltered and humid. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, preferably inside under a bottle or all right. if you've got a glass house under the bench where yep. it's shady. Yeah. So you yep. keep them out of the direct sunlight yep. and you make sure that they've got good humidity. That's right. And, and don't water them too often. Yeah. So you'd water them in first though, but then you'd... Then you'd leave them for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. Some days? Yeah, some days, if not yeah. weeks. Thank goodness me. Yeah. All right, so... Dry is better than wet. Now, we're going to show people how cane and, and bush begonias can be propagated. It's a more classical way, is it not? It's pretty normal, I think. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to do stem cuttings. Yeah. Uh, again, the timing of the cuttings is? But when the plant's in full growth. Yeah. Growing so, strongly. Yeah, so yeah. it needs to be really strong. And do you select a piece of wood that is a particular part of the plant usually? Wood that's just starting to harden, I think. Yeah, so not the very, very not tips. Not the very, very tips, although you could get away with that if you had humidity. All right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, well, you better show us how we go about preparing one of those. We'll probably get two cuttings out of this one, I think. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so we do... I'm gonna take that big leaf off. So again, you reduce the leaf area. Yeah, and the casing. Just oh yes, any of those little stipuli bits. Cause mold or ah, something. right. Yeah. Cut that off. Tidy the wound up. Back in the trusty powder. So really you've left one small but entire leaf. That's right. Uh, and you cut just below a node. Yep. Uh, and so it's a two nodal cutting. It's a two nodal cutting. Yep. More is better. If you can bury two nodes, so much the better. Oh yeah, so if you if the nodes roots. are close enough you'll yeah. you'll get roots from yeah. every node. That's right. And you do basically the same thing same again, thing. just pop it in, yeah. water it in, yep. and put it in the same conditions. That's right. And yeah. I guess this yes, the other piece you've got there. Um Take that off, I think. Yeah. And that's a bit soft, so we'll cut, chop a bit off it. All right, so reduce the that's area. the hardest part, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so then that makes another cutting as that's well. That's right. All right, so we've got two um, cane begonias struck. I guess we should just look at the, the shrubby one a little bit and see whether there's any difference with that. Same process. Yep. Yeah. yeah, same process. So that's a cutting, yeah. simple as that. Yeah. And, and really, if you're wanting to learn about striking cuttings, this is probably a good genus to start with. Well, you've, you, it's a fairly, a fairly fail-safe. Not very challenging. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's easy enough. Anybody should be able to do it then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All if right. you don't have rooting hormone, don't go and buy a whole heap because it'll still make roots. Yeah, and also it does tend to go off after a period of time anyway. So if you've got hormone sitting there, you might well be dipping it in something that has no impact. Yeah. All right, now another question about propagating, Craig. I have heard people striking begonias, like a lot of other things, yeah. uh, in a glass of water. What's your attitude to growing them that way? Certainly you can do it. I find the transfer from the water to the potting mix problematic. Ah, yes, because they produce a different sort of root different system in the water. System, that's right. yeah. Yeah. So you would have a, a plant that would go into some sort of shock as soon as you pot it up into, yeah. into potting mix. That's my experience. It's a fairly high attrition rate. Ah, uh, right. So it's better to start them off in a propagating mix where they produce the right sort of root system. That's right. Yeah. All right, Craig, you've potted these ones up some little time ago. How long do you reckon they've been in those pots for? A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Three weeks. Well, it's been pretty warm. Yeah, well, we have had some warm weather. That's so right. so you're fairly confident these have got roots. They have them. got roots. All right. Yeah. Um, that does raise a question. I know that I regularly get clients who come in and they say, I keep pulling it out to see if it's got roots on it. <laughs> so how do you know that they're struck? Well, you can just sort of... Yeah, if you give it a little time. Uh, yeah, not yeah. enough to pull it out of the pot. Yeah. yeah, so, all right. So you feel quite confident that these are nicely struck. I do. Uh, let's start with the leaf cuttings. The leaf cuttings. So, so you begonia, see we've got four in there. Yeah, Taiwanese. So there's Begonia Taiwanese, they're leaf cuttings. And all let's right. Just have a look. Let's have a look and see what's happened in there. Oh, yes, you can see that there's roots all the way around there. Yeah. And it's actually quite a good root ball. All right, so that had quite a nice little root system under it, so yep. that looks fantastic. So you would now pop that into a classical potting mix? Standard then? potting mix. A standard potting mix, so yep. well-drained, yep. uh, et cetera. Do you feed as soon as you pot? I do. Yeah. Yeah, liquid feed. So they get a liquid feed as soon as they get potted yep. up. And, and because they're not going to be watered for some time, mm. then they'll be sitting in that. 
Oh, right. Yeah. So, and I guess because they're a very quick growing type of plant, you can't sort of stretch things out, can you? They've no. all got to be done fairly quickly. That's right. All right, so show me how you would pot one of those leaf cuttings up. Do you try and get them down to the same sort of level they were in in the Pretty original pot? Pretty much the same level with, you have to with the leaf cuttings. Yeah. Yeah. And how long will it take, Craig, for those leaf cuttings to actually start producing that new begonia? And probably not, just... not at this stage of the year, probably not until the spring. So they'll sit like that they'll more or less? They'll sit like that, but the roots will grow. Yeah. 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 And uh, so you won't see anything much other than that funny little cut off leaf yeah. until uh, our springtime when the weather starts to work. That's probably right, depending yeah. on what the weather does. Yeah. Yeah. If you're in Queensland, I'd imagine it would happen very quickly. All oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so although the the process of producing the new plant is quite quick, it's going to be a little while before the plant is big enough to do anything with. Which is driven by my climate or our climate. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. All right, Craig, show me your wonderful uh, root system on your little cane begonias. Begonia elbow picta. It's a yeah. nice one. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's got fabulous root system. Look at that. Yeah. That's really good. You can see the roots are all around there. It's even starting to send up some shoots. So I'm assuming this plant potted up now will keep growing. It'll keep growing. That's yeah. right. So yeah. you might have a plant ready for sale before the autumn finishes. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yep. yeah. yeah. So that's quite a quick turnover. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do with the canes is, is bury lots of the trunk. All right. So you take it well down into the pot. Yeah, see? Yes, you've got it. Yeah. Almost just clear of the top, and that is just gives them stability. All oh, right, so they're not flopping around everywhere. Yeah, yeah, so if you are watering or something, you're not going to disrupt the That's roots. That's right, and it'll make more roots down the stem now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so of course, it's all about root system. If you get a good, strong root system on something, it makes all the difference That's in the right. world. So, there you go one instant cane begonia. Stephen Ryan, I think I really do think we have covered everything begonia ish now. Well, as much as you can with such a huge genus, but yeah. nonetheless, I think we've done quite well, and Craig has been particularly helpful with yes. his knowledge. Yes. So I've learned a, an enormous amount about this group of plants, and I hate to say this, this could in fact be my next passion. Well, it's kind of mine already. I love begonias, and it's been so great to spend time with Craig, who is such an expert on all the multi-facets of growing them. Of course, it's specific to each climate and environment yeah. that you're in, so what might work for him might not work for you. But here's some uh, leaf cuttings that um, Craig had taken. Actually, he hasn't put a date on it. That's wicked. Oh, yes. But he did say a few months ago. Yeah. And um, a cane cutting which that's is also nicely grown. a few weeks, which is starting yeah. to grow on very well. So amazingly easy to propagate. Yeah, so these are ideal plants for the beginner gardener, I think. And I have to say, just in passing, that it's really important if you get engaged with a group of plants like this, consider the idea of joining a specialist society. Yes. Uh, we have very strong begonia societies here in Australia. Yeah. I know that the uh, USA and Britain also have very strong societies for begonias, and there may well be some others in parts of Europe. And So look out for your local begonia society. Not only will you meet a whole pile of experts that will help you with your passion, yes. you will also get the opportunity to buy plants that aren't commercially available. Yes, and that, I hate to say, is the only reason I joined the Melbourne Begonia Society, because I went to their sales day and nearly uh. wet myself with excitement. <laughs> well, there you go. So There were so many, many wonderful things. So. All of the things that we've been looking at largely, so all of the begonias in this polytunnel shade house and all of the things that uh, we were just potting with um, Craig are all available in his nursery. So it's Gentiana. I'll put the link below. Uh, Craig does ship through, yes. um, through his website. He can't ship to quarantine states in Australia and no Australian producer can ship things internationally, unfortunately. But yeah. for those of you in Australia and in non-quarantine states, yes. Do go to his website or come and visit Gentiana Nursery up here in the Dunlongs in Melbourne. Yes, I would definitely recommend a visit to the nursery if it's within your uh, possibilities because you will find things here you didn't know you needed. Absolutely, which we always do yes. every time we're here. But we are not here next time, Stephen. No, we'll, might we be? goodness knows. We'll be somewhere else and talking about some other group of plants or visiting a garden or whatever. So come along on the journey with us. Make sure you subscribe. Press the alert button to remind you each week when our videos come up. 
And of course, we have our Monday shorts. Yes, so do leave a question in the comments below if you have a question for Steve and Ryan. We'll try and answer it. But until then, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, all.